There was another kind of excitement in London streets that year. That was the day that crowds marched to cheer and demonstrate outside the Italian embassy. Italy had declared war on Austria, Germany's close ally. And Italy's British friends enthusiastically showed their approval. Italians living in Britain who left to join their country's forces got wild send-offs at the railway stations. Several months were to pass before Italy was to declare war on Germany herself, but Austria at least was a good start. So up from the plains into the mountains along the Austrian border marched Italy's armies. The Italian people didn't want to lose them, but they too thought they ought to go. And so began the long, bitter struggle amid the peaks and snows of the highest battlefield in the world. Italy was off to war, and so too was the first of Kitchener's new armies. Last minute tattooing, I love Alice, the packing of kit bags, and they too were off, and no army left in greater spirits. As the sergeant said, you'll be marched off to the station at Ho 800 hours. At the hen training point, there will be held a ceremonial parade in which no other than Prince Arthur of Connaught himself will inspect you and wish you good speed. So I want ranks neat and straight. Get me? Straight. From then on, well, you'll be on your own. But though I won't be with you, I'll expect you to make me proud of you. Get me? Proud, and the best of luck. And so off to war they went, those first brave thousands. There's but to do and die. Across the English Channel to France in the ships dazzle painted to confuse the U-boats in that other war the Allies were fighting hard to win. Nineteen fifteen witnessed the British victory on the Dogger Bank. There, the death throes of the German battleship Blucher provided those who watched with a vivid demonstration of the inhuman senselessness of war. But though her surface ships remained, for the most part, in home waters, with the U-boats, Germany played an ace. As yet, Britain's shops were still well stocked with food and there wasn't much going without. Cues and ration cards were as yet undreamed of. There were more women serving in those shops, but the full application of British woman power was something else too for the future. Complete, unrestricted U-boat warfare was yet to be experienced. But in and around the ports of Britain, the pathetic victims of torpedoings on the high seas were spectacles becoming too frequent for comfort. Britain was getting her first taste of total war and expressed her anger. The smashing up of German-owned shops became commonplace. There was more and more outcry to intern all aliens. The sinking of the Lusitania, the Arabic, the shooting of a nurse named Edith Cavell by the Germans all added their quota to the count of broken windows and looted, destroyed premises. It was time, high time, for retaliation. And the retaliation in 1915 was the battle called Luz. In the onslaught upon a little coal mining town, Kitchener's new armies knew their baptism of fire. The sergeant wasn't with them, but had he been, he would have been proud. When before the German hail of lead and explosive, even these stout-hearted hesitated, 
Piper Laidlaw mounted the parapet and won his Victoria Cross, piping his comrades forward. After lose was over, you counted up the prisoners, measured the few thousand square yards of ground gained, and on balance, you declared it a victory. But what are the terrible cost? The ambulances pulling away from Britain's railway stations were mute evidence of the real facts of the victory at Lewes. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them. All that was left of them. On Gallipoli, on S Beach, V, X, Y and Z Beaches, nothing now but graves. Realizing defeat in their hopes of a quick victory against the Turks, the Allies withdrew, leaving those Turks only wooden crosses to read and mark. And so 1915 drew to its close on a note of bitterness, a note of sharp criticism on the conduct of the war by those in high places, a note that someone ought to do better, for someone had blundered. And thus, in 1915, there came about a great shifting in these high places. For David Lloyd George, it meant that full leadership was now only a step away. But for others, Gallipoli and Lewis meant banishment from office to the wilderness. The first Lord of the Admiralty resigned to become a major in the field, Major Winston Churchill. For the British Commander-in-Chief French, it meant yielding place to another, to a soldier who promised better, Douglas Haig. The tumult and the shouting died, the captains departed while others took their places. For the new armies, the war must go on, and other men marched to the entraining points at 0800 hours. So I want ranks neat and straight, get me? Straight. From then on, well, you'll be on your own. But though I won't be with you, I'll expect you to make me proud of you, get me? Proud. And the best of luck. But we think you 